What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Whiskey Web and Whatnot with your hosts, Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. Glory, glory, man united. You didn't think you were going to get singing, didn't you? Yeah, Chuck is excited because uh, football or soccer or whatever you want to refer to it as is happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, but dear listener, I've shaved off this time for you because I'm committed to your enjoyment, your knowledge, and your pleasure. Indeed. We'll, In see, if we're com- <laughs> we'll see if we're committed enough to uh, download huge video files to uh, do all of that conference stuff later or not. But that, you mean that yeah. conference? Yeah, so those are all the next episodes. I mean, once you hear this, it will have been several episodes ago, so that's confusing, but... Yeah, talking um, to future you, you'll see. (laughs) Yeah, go back and and listen to those again and be like, wow, either that video is super, super crisp, or we just got the 1080p version because I was lazy. We'll see. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes, so if you haven't caught on yet, listener... Today's episode will be Robbie and myself, I, the purveyor of many hats, and Robbie, the complainer of many hats, <laughs> as you'll see coming soon. Yes. Uh, if there's an opinion to be had or a complaint to be made, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, in a, in a Jackson 5 kind of way. All right, so <laughs> today's whiskey is the Jack Daniels Sinatra Select. Which from in this dope ass yeah. box? Yes, there you go. So it does come in nice ornate packaging. It has a book with a story in it. If you like stories, and one of the most notable things I thought was interesting is that it is in a one liter format. So it is not seven fifty milliliter like a standard uh, bottle of liquor. And so, yeah, why did they do that? I don't know. I wonder if a le- I think a liter used to be like what all the pa- all of the the liquor was mm. in. And then I they realized they, they could make a little more money. Yeah, you shave off a little bit, make it less to try to maintain pricing and things like mm. that. Who knows? Just like what, ice cream where it used to be a half gallon and now it's mm-hmm. like a couple scoops. Is it not a half gallon anymore? Mm-mm. Those like Briars things aren't a half gallon? No, I'm not sure what they really are, but if you ever had Bluebell ice cream, it's yeah. really a half gallon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, and and the, they seem the big. other ones are smaller. Yeah. That's interesting. Isn't it funny in America where, like, we're known for portion sizes? And I think that holds true a lot for, like, eating out. Like, the plates are giant, so they can charge you 20 bucks for everything. But, like, yeah, in, like, grocery items and stuff, it's shrinking. So, huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Today. Yeah, it's all about the margins. <sighs> yes. And, and padding and other CSS jokes. But, mm-hmm. Okay, so this is 90 proof, which I think is standard for Jack Daniels, if I remember correctly. Standard Jack Daniels mash bill of 80% corn, 8% rye, and 12% malted barley. Filtered through maple charcoal, so that it has to be called Tennessee whiskey and not bourbon. Uh, They say one of their secret sauces of this particular one is that it's made with their unique Sinatra barrels, which have deep grooves specifically carved into the staves to expose the whiskey to extra layers of toasted oak. I guess that's true. I did see a picture of these barrels, and they, like, put some machine in there and, like, shave these rings just in the middle. And then they leave the shavings in there, just laws, because it has to be unadulterated barrels. You know, they're, they're new and they're charred. Weird rule. I assumed but, uh, a Sinatra barrel would just be like singing, yeah, all the just time. Singing. Like the guy has been dead for twenty years and all of that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that and that it's rumored to be aged a few years longer. So, no, nothing confirms that on the Jack Daniel's site, but whiskey people say that. Oh yeah, Foley. I smell strawberry ice cream. Hmm. Astronaut or real? Mm, Somewhere in between. It's Mm. not as fruity as real, maybe. I'm getting more of a a red cotton candy, which should smell the same as the blue and some other things. But yeah, more of like a cotton candy. Cotton candy doesn't have any flavors, right? It's just arbitrarily colored. 
It's just colored. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's stringed sugar, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. You can make it in a blender at home. <laughs> Never tried that. Feels messy enough as is. Like, no, thank you. Alrighty. So, yeah, it has a very sweet smell to me. Slight must. Not musk. Don't confuse those. All right, I'm going to prime it up. Got kind of a rindy bitterness at the finish, but that's just. It does have some bitterness to it. My face doesn't say good things, but yeah. it's just strange because it goes from sweet to bitter very quickly. So my palate is a, trying to adjust to that. Like it has some yeah. of that. It's like eating a sour candy. Not right. sour at all, but like it does similar things of like, yeah, oh, you whoa. get like that sugar initially. And then all of a sudden you start to get a strong oppositional flavor. And like, I'm trying to adapt to that. And let that sit for a few. Yeah, it has kind of a syrupy quality in the beginning and then quickly shifts. Um, it does feel like a little more burny than I expect for a 90 proof. I mean, I know that's not an 80, but for me, typically a, a lot of times a 90 would, uh, go down pretty smoothly and this one seems to kind of want to i don't know hang in the back of your throat a little bit yeah it feels that, get... it feels pretty harsh i feel like it tastes kind of like you know it's it's got a good bit of wood to it to where <clears throat> but not in a good way like mm. like i'm yeah. chewing on a non-aged stick like i just broke a a limb off a tree and then like just <laughs> chewing on that and like i don't imagine that would taste great so that's kind of what this is you tasting. Don't, you, don't, you don't chew sticks? You don't just find sticks and chew them? I mean, that's I what... I, I thought that was like straw or hay or... Uh, no, it could wheat. be sticks too. I mean, it's or good whatever. for your teeth. Mm. Never never had a cavity, no braces. It's because <laughs> of sticks. Yeah, yeah. So it has a syrupiness for me initially. It Keep your face in the mic, bro. Yeah, I guess some of that like like woodiness to to bitterness is is there, and then like I don't know, almost like a like a spicy cinnamon kind of like you know you get like a really spicy cinnamon gum, like and that hangs out for a bit like in the back of my throat. I'm kind of getting yeah. that. I don't know. I, uh, I feel like it's not all that complex. Like it doesn't taste a ton different than just Jack Daniels to me, and I'm sure yeah. some of that is intentional because that's what. Frank Sinatra supposedly liked the best, so right. Why change it a ton if you're trying to be true to him? I guess, but yeah, you're trying to get it. I <laughs> I feel like this is, you know, aged slightly longer. Some weird stave thing is like I feel like it's mostly marketing, to be honest. And given the price point of this, which I don't know exactly what we paid, but I've seen the range, which seems to be average around one fifty a bottle. Yeah, I think it was like 200 for us. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that was because we bought it secondhand, but... Right, yeah. So at certain times, you're like kind of getting the markup pr the markup prices instead of just total wine or something of that nature. So yeah, given the price too, I can't say I'm overly impressed. Like, yeah, I like Frank Sinatra. I don't, I don't need to wear his suits or drink his whiskey in order to enjoy him, but, you know... I don't know. Let's just get into it. You want to talk about the tentacle scale? Dear listener, you've heard this over and over again, but just in case you forget, short-term memory, we use the scale from zero to eight tentacles. As developers, we want to stay zero-based, and zero being terrible, four being yeah, and eight being amazing for a Jack Daniels even. I don't know. Yeah, for me, this is pretty mid like this is probably like marginally better than a regular Jack Daniels, but at you know what six times seven, almost seven times the price, I would say of a bottle of Jack Daniels, I'm not feeling it so much. <laughs> yeah. Nicer packaging is only takes you so far. I guess if I was just displaying this to show off to my other Rat Pack fandom, then I might feel better about it so 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess given that, I've just talked myself into a three. It's like below average because it costs so much more than, than the average. To me, I'm just looking at regular Jack Daniels as being the average. And this costs me a lot more for not a lot more on the flavor profile. I might come back to it because I am going to add a few drops and see what happens. Yeah, I think for me, it's probably because it's so expensive and like, I feel like it has, doesn't really add much of anything other than like, I feel cool looking at it. I'm going to give it a three because it's like, it's unimpressive. Like if this were the normal Jack Daniels and it were, you know, this tiny little bit better then I think maybe Jack Daniels on its own could be a little bit higher, but. Yeah, I'm not not getting a lot of lot that I love out of it. So yeah, sixty bucks you can buy a gentleman Jack, which is an elevated Jack Daniels, and I would say that is better value for money, far beyond this. I have read about a few different expressions they've released, you know, this year or late last year. They were like twelve and fifteen year. I know there's a twelve year mm. for sure. I feel like there's maybe another one, and uh, and those are supposed to be quite good. You know, slightly different expressions, different. There's a lot more to know about what's going into that, too. Like, oh, okay, it's a single barrel, where on the rack was it, and that kind of stuff that you can get to know. This is all mystery, which feels like that's because there's not much more story to tell. Mm -hmm. Alas, there we are. Hmm. It mellows a little with a, with a little water. It starts to become a little more... So I put three drops in, and it starts to just still be a little more maple-y throughout. A little less bite on the end. Still hangs in the throat a little bit, but that whole, like, knock me over with some bitterness has tempered. So it's yeah. made it more tolerable to drink. Not necessarily something I'd buy at this price point either way. Yeah. Didn't you say that... Am I totally imagining this, or did you say that Sinatra would usually put some water in it? Yeah, they even have it on the website, actually, like, drink it like Frank, and he would do three cubes, two fingers of whiskey, and a splash of water. Hmm. So I wonder if you do that, if this is, like, ideal for that setup. I don't know. I wonder if you do that for regular Jack Daniels, <laughs> if you're just as satisfied with the outcome, you know? Probably, so... so. I don't know a lot of people who drink Jack Daniels straight, like just the normal whatever, let's say $25, $30 bottle. I don't know what Jack Daniels costs. I mean, but like let's just say you're, you know, you go to the liquor store. It's available everywhere. It's the like one rock stars would chug to. You get that. And I, I just don't know many people who just drink that straight. It feels like that is always like a Jack and Coke kind of drinker. Yeah. Which is fine. If that's the way you like it, then great. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's all marketing, too. It's like you really just want a whiskey and Coke, but you just like know of that brand, so it's easier yeah. to order. I, I would say that you're probably attached to the sweeter flavor because of the maple charcoal filtering, right? Like you, you definitely are wanting that, and that is unique to Jack Daniels, so you give, you know, I give them that. I mean, conversely, you're like, yeah, you could Jim Beam and Coke it, and then you're not getting sweetness. You're getting just normal flavor i don't know some people do like a makers too which is weeded might have slightly more sweetness yeah. without adding i maple. can tell you what you don't want to do okay you don't tell want me to what do I don't beam know. and uh what do you call the, the little kool-aids that are in like the plastic uh bottles what? that you like twist the top off oh the little know? plastic twist off kool-aid things yeah. i don't even know what those are called but i remember i mean yeah my kids have had them before yeah whatever else yeah we yeah. had those in like took the tops off and like drank a little bit of the Kool-Aid and just like poured a bunch of Jim Beam in the top. I don't even know how we got it in there very carefully, mm -hmm. I guess, because the hole's pretty small. Sure. But uh, yeah, it was, once we got it put together, I was like, this is not tasty. I would not no. recommend. <laughs> no, I don't think that's a whiskey. That's like vodka, maybe rum. That's about it. You know, Kool-Aid and Kool-Aid well, is a mixer. When you're not old enough to uh, buy your own alcohol, you do what you have to do. Yeah, you take what you can. <laughs> I mean, we would just usually find random two liters. So, oh, okay, it looks like it's only Mountain Dew. That doesn't taste to get good together. But what you do is you, you like chug a little, 
you know, a little bit of whiskey or what cheap vodka, whatever you have, chase it with your Mountain Dew. And Mountain yeah. Dew tends to cover up a lot. Oh, yeah. It's a yeah. powerful flavor. Yeah. I luckily in life graduated beyond the arbitrary chasers for whatever cheap liquor <laughs> I can procure at yes. that time. So hallelujah for that. Yeah. Progress, commerce, capitalism. Speaking of progress and capitalism, do you want to go into this first web point you had here? I, I do just because it's been like this week, it's kind of been a topic spurned on by a few different, I think it might've come from, I can't remember if it was a Reddit or Hacker News post initially, but, and then it's on tech Twitter and people are talking about like, and we've seen this more than once in the last couple of months where people get kind of like thrown awry because they randomly, they all of a sudden get, you know, $20,000 bill from Vercel or a hundred thousand dollar bill from Netlify or, you know, whatever. And because that these are hosting services, hosting services, I mean, use that very loosely because they are companies built on an, another hosting service that is com complex. And the whole thought is this is dev on easy mode mm -hmm. where, you know, like many other tools, it's supposed to help you build on easy to a point and then until it's not. And then it's either like time to grow up and pay a big boy bill or you get surprised with a big boy bill from like DDoS attacks or, you know, any number of like potential insecurities in your site as you build your thing with bleeding edge technology, expecting a very simple outcome. And I think it's an interesting thing. I mean, you sign up for a service, you, most people don't read the legal speak, but Again, they were pitching themselves as, "Hey, we're we're a you know we're AWS easy, so get all the cost benefits of AWS within our platform, which is basically the AOL for developers, and you know life is good and easy, and all these things that you would have had to learn and learn how to manage and turn on and off and whatever else we do for you, but not really, because if we get hit with a big bill, we're going to give it to you." Yeah, yeah, I think. It's a delicate balance because I always tend to argue that if you are big enough to get a big bill, you probably should afford the big bill. Like unless somebody fucked something up and like, I don't know, did something that like recursively called like recursively wrote to the database infinitely and like, you know, something weird to like, you know, mess up like that or a DDoS attack or, or something out of your control. Yeah. If it's based on actual usage, like, I think that's fine. I think there needs to be some kind of lever to pull that's like, you know, oh, I can show that these 10 million hits were like fake. And then there needs to be some sort of up the chain mitigation type of thing for that. Because like, if you're small and you actually didn't get that traffic, then you're not really probably monetizing at that level. And there's no way you could pay those bills. Yeah. And I mean, that being said, you could also just not pay them. Like, I guess there's that. They're, they're probably, if it's 20 grand, they're probably not going to sue you. They'll probably like send you some threatening letters and stuff. But like, you know, I well, have a, so a very pessimistic view of that whole system because you can just not pay whatever you want and like sue me. Fine. <laughs> mm, interesting. So here you go. Legal advice from, from Robbie the Wagner is. Yeah. Legal just, expert, little just don't don't pay your bills if you don't want to, or if you're not making enough money, or if you want to keep some of your money. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think the assumption is always like, well, yeah, you start having the usage that necessitates you use more, you pay more. I mean, it's just it's not free forever. That's I think the business model for a lot of these services. I mean, I think you know, cloud services in general kind of go down that path. Um, of thinking a lot of times and which is fine but then there just ends up being edge cases and fallacies and it feels like those edge cases are becoming a little more a little more prevalent in these cases like the one guy had just basically a shit ton of egress because he had like a four megabyte mp3 up that like 
I don't know, bots got aware of and then like started like hitting up like crazy. So then there's usage because the usage is there for having his site active and then for serving this file, you know, X number of times to a hundred gigabytes or whatever it was. So, you know, like that's, that's basically like such a strange edge case and feels like, I don't know, you would have some alarm, like you should have some yeah, alarms. Or it something. feels like they should block that. Like, right. If you're using the right provider, they probably can detect, oh, like this is a shitload more traffic than you usually have. Let's look at these IP addresses. Oh, this is clearly like a botnet that's just trying to take all of your money. Yeah. Let's block traffic for 30 minutes and see if it goes away or something. Like, I think yeah. there needs to be something like that in these easy mode type of SaaS products. People have no idea what they're doing. If you haven't opened the AWS console and configured all of this yourself, you don't know yeah. how it works. So, like, they need to protect you. Yeah. I mean, I that's kind of what I think. I think that if they are, you know, the whole... It's a strange comparison, but it's a sort of like AOL to the internet, right? The internet is the Wild West, and AOL was like a comfy portal for that that provided nice guardrails for you that you were happy to never escape from. And, you know, I know it's not going to like make them a unicorn, but, you know, if for sell, kind of provide, especially in like, I don't know, what is it, the hobby, the non-pro plans, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you're like at certain levels, like understanding the user wants control assumed and less opted out explicitly versus some kind of inverse. And uh, that would make a lot more sense for me. If that's like what you're trying to be is, you know, the, the happy platform for developers to come and play and build things in, then then provide that like you know so yeah. hopefully there's enough I feel pressure like, i feel like yeah they could have like an enterprise tier which they already have but like sure, sure. there should be something that's monitoring like if anything is blowing up be like we noticed this is blowing up it's going to be expensive are you expecting to be blowing up right now if not yeah like let click this button to shut it down if yes like here's a button to give us a bunch more money and opt into enterprise mode because you actually want this. Like, yeah, maybe. I need to give you You that choice. Right. Like, is it your job as a singular hobbyist to add, you know, monitoring and observability? It feels like some of that should come for free. I think, yeah, I think they're thinking you should, but I do think it should be built in. Yeah, the use cases there, I think, maybe were, are a little askew. So, you know, even if you're just trying to have, like, a side hustle startup kind of thing, like, again, you you don't necessarily think about those kinds of problems until you uh, encounter them, and then you address that problem. But, like, you're not, like, architecting an enterprise application out of the gate. Mm-hmm. I think right. that's another kind of flaw there. So. You know, if you want to own, if, if, if these companies want to own a slice of developer experience, then I think that there's a level of responsibility to that community that should come into play. Yeah, yeah I agree. So Guillermo, I know you're listening. Build all this in for us and don't charge anyone that wasn't expecting it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, like he did have discourse with the one person that had like, I don't know, like $20,000 bill or whatever. And the team addressed that and they reduced the bill and, you know, some of that kind of stuff. It doesn't, doesn't mean they've put in anything that stops it next time, but yeah. they have like publicly addressed things. Yeah, I think Amazon too, well, like is pretty reasonable about it, especially with a someone like Vercel who's doing so much with them. I'm sure they have like a dedicated answer me right now support guy and yeah, like for sure you just tell that guy like oops this guy like did something wrong and then aws is like oh actually yeah you know our real costs for serving all this data was like i don't know 50 bucks we'll just charge you that instead of like fifty thousand dollars and then yeah. it's like cool we're all happy <laughs> like, right exactly it's like you know 
from a cost perspective for Amazon, which is like constantly driving down cheaper and cheaper and cheaper all the time. Like, can you imagine that thing for them that many layers deep at the heart of it? It, it was like, oh, well, this cost us looks like 80 cents in electricity, <laughs> these fractional <laughs> moments on this server for those three hours. Oof, yeah, I guess if you like break down that hardware cost, that's another four dollars and fifteen cents. Let's just call it uh, a flat five, five bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I'm sure it's something of that nature that does have me kind of dovetail into though something I didn't put a thing there, but maybe related. I don't know. Is that like? why do I keep coming across other products that are, uh, that Vercel or Guillermo directly are investors in? Like, am I wrong? Too uh, much are, money. So of yeah, but, investors and everything. I mean, that's crazy. Like, aren't you investing in your own company, building all the, all the things and driving react and all these other things? Like you got so much money that you had to buy some other companies and invest in other companies. I mean, I just, I'm seeing it all over the place. And so then there's like, they bought the turbo repo stuff mm -hmm. and then that came into their ecosystem. And then I just see where they, like they invest in, I don't know, whatever UI library thing, whatever component, like, I don't know, were they like maybe even investors in clerk? I know, uh, since yeah, they invest in everything. Like, I don't know if their intentions are always pure or not, but it's like their investors in Nuxt, which is the view competitor to Next, has nothing to do with like none of the technologies are the same. Right. They invest in Astro, like yeah, yeah all these true. different things. I think on some level they genuinely want to push the web forward, which is great. But I right. think on another level they're hedging bets of like if React went away tomorrow. I guess their next thing would be Svelte. And we're going to talk to Rich Harris soon about all of that. But like, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know the why, if it's like, if there's direct financial incentive to do so, or if it's more goodwill or not, or some of both. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is curious to me because it sounds like, I mean, I know at times you can, you know, make acquisitions that make sense for business objectives, right? It's almost like software. It's like buy versus build sometimes. I get yeah. that, but some of the investments aren't totally clear to me. Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe you want to be such a web platform from like start to finish off and everything else. Like every SaaS, you could just tie them all together and click three buttons and have AI write your whole application. So now it's no code and everything yeah. happens in one place. I, yeah, it's hard for me to say. I'm obviously not business savvy enough in that way at that scale to really know for sure. But well, I think it, some of it is similar to like the journey of AWS as it started of like, okay, we built all of this infrastructure to sell you stuff and we don't need all this infrastructure, but we did a really great job building it all. Why don't we just scale it up? Like keep having more data centers, let other people pay us tons of money to use it. Cause we already figured this out. Yeah. So like the same is true with Vercel of like, you know, we're going to start with next JS and we're going to be the best place to host next JS. And that's our framework. And like, it has all this secret sauce, but also why wouldn't we kill Netlify on the way up? Like, <laughs> we should just let everything be hosted here and we should partner with every framework and like, you know, make it the best experience for everyone because yes, they're not our bread and butter and they're not making us as much money as maybe these huge next JS apps. But if you capture every little project written in Astro that like someone does and a few of those blow up and make you some money that makes them money and like, why not? Right. I think it's just like bootstrapping the future of like, being able to do everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can certainly agree with that in the sense of like, while next is a good sort of like entry point into Vercel potentially, right? Like use the thing we built. It obviously works best here. You don't, you know, if you want all of those efficiencies, but also now we're using those learnings to apply it to other things too. And 
we know how to provide some best in class experiences there. I mean, that, t- that totally makes sense. It is an interesting thing, though, again, when you build your entire company on top of another company, which I guess in some ways yeah, that, that can be yeah. a problem. Yeah. It feels interesting to like repackage that, right? Like, so that tells me at the end of the day, every tool you need, I mean, obviously it's not easy by any means, but let's just say that's why there's the open next project, right? They reverse engineer and they're say, showing you this is exactly how they do it. You can do this without them at a fraction of the cost. Yeah. I think the, the AWS thing is an interesting phenomenon because you would think, right, like, why don't they make the consoles better? Or why don't they acquire Vercel to make, like, that the new way you configure stuff? And, like, because they want people to build stuff like this yeah. to drive up their usage, because if they acquire it, then it's all internal usage. Yeah. They want yeah. an external company paying them big piles of cash, and it's it's a beautiful business model. Like, they had a chance... Is to be like, you know, who's going to acquire Slack, right? Like they could have, we use it a lot there, but it's yeah. one of the biggest AWS users. So why would you cannibalize your usage? Yeah, nope. Absolutely. <laughs> right. So there's the other side of things is you have, yeah, decentralized applications like that, that all the infrastructure lives there. Yeah. I mean, for them, they're like, we have the farm, you need the farm come use it all you want. We could make it easier, but this works. Why would we spend money when it's already working? Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's felt weird and opposite to me when I first figured all that out, but like makes total sense now. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to pay servers a salary. That's an interesting distinction there. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, so yeah hmm. okay let's see yeah i guess go into your thing i know you okay to. you're okay budget. yeah i don't know i was just trying to read what you wrote and, and see if we could talk about it we can come back to it if you want yeah so i was just curious like you know there's all these different size companies Obviously, Amazon is like the biggest employer in the world. So like they're different than, you know, a startup, which is different than a, you know, well-funded mid-tier, like not a startup anymore, but not a not a big like fang company, all Mm -hmm. all different spectrums. And it's like, how do we define what is a CTO first off? And then like, what is their role in the company is it like to actually look at everything everyone's doing and like go oh you're doing this this way there's a more efficient algorithm for this there's a you know Mm -hmm. i've done this this way and this should go this way i see you didn't follow like these edge cases or test for this like here's like like should they be that granular or is it more like hey let me pick some technologies we might use and like give some theoretical best practices and like check in with me if you want advice, but otherwise I'm going to like trust all of my teams to do what they, what they want to do. Because if like, if you don't allow people to try stuff and fail, then it's like they don't learn. And it, and then there's like no process of like planning and ticketing and like all of that is meaningless because like, people on high come down and they're just like, Oh yeah, redo all this. Cause it's not what I wanted. Like, right. I'm just curious on your thoughts of like, you know, the, the fine line there and, and what you think those roles are. I mean, I can't presume to, to know if you're citing perhaps a very specific situation, current or past. We're not going to go into specifics, okay. but uh, okay. Yes. So, Obviously, the answer is always, it depends. If you are, you know, like people get the title CTO, for example, in a lot of startups, right? Like your founders group will end up with C-level titles based on that status as a founder. And oftentimes that means hands-on keyboard, creating the basis of the company, right? So in those 
times, even as that team begins to grow, that role still probably has like hands on keyboard and is really a little more like staff, principal engineer kind of level, right? Like, yeah, lead I'm engineer. still going to yeah. be or lead, you know, as the team grows, you may go from like technical lead up into like more principal architecture things with like your finger on the pulse. Let's just say that that's still like a small team that includes that person as an individual contributor. But again, that's a very like non-traditional scenario. It's a more of like, we're starting a company and we have all hands on deck because we're making the thing, right? Where we're, we're creating that or, uh, you know, we pivoted and we have the next MVP or something of that nature. So let's just assume we're not talking about that scenario. You know, startups, seed rounds, whatever that is, where boots on the ground, probably matter a whole bunch more and everything's small enough where there's a lot of visibility across the board. So people are like having conversations with the CTO all the time. I'd say now when you have more mature companies, it just means like larger org and all of that kind of stuff where like the CTO is a member of the leadership, executive leadership team. And there's a lot of business strategy happening at that level. And then there's technical strategy happening from a CTO. So a CTO will tend to help form a technical direction from say like, oh, AI seems to really getting traction. I feel like there could be some possibilities for AI to help our business in A, B, or C. And then that goes down to others in order to like, investigate and implement and whatever that amounts to in that instance i wouldn't see a cto as looking at a pr right no pull right. request reviews from your cto that to me shows a lack of trust in the team because if you're coming down to say yeah this implementation isn't quite right and, you know, I would have thought about ABC or I would have gone this other direction or, you know, whatever else. Like if you're granular like that, I don't think that's a good look. I mean, I've been a part of organizations that say we're like 20 plus people where even then I felt the CTO shouldn't be up in everybody's grill and every single pull request and would be over yeah. being like, mm, not a map. I would use a filter like fuck off. Don't worry about my array mapping like that yeah. much, like these kinds of things. Like, I'm glad you would do it that way. You're not hacking away by yourself in an office creating this company anymore. You're, yeah. You've got other stuff to go, you know? I think it really kills team morale to do that. Of Big like, time. You know, I was the tech lead on this feature and I just like planned everything and built it all. And then like, I'm pleased with it. Most of the team's pleased with it. We're, you know, blissfully unaware of any potential technical implications and then it's like oh have you thought about like these cases which like maybe are valid cases but they like don't matter for like the next couple years to like like they're irrelevant for shipping this feature but like a, a thing we should probably consider and refactor and whatever should that shut the whole project down right there i don't think so i think it's like it's valid to voice yeah. opinions like that like one you shouldn't have been looking at it in the first place i agree with that but yeah. then, like, if you have and we're all kind of collaborating on the solution, I think there needs to be flexibility of, like, you know, I actually really appreciate all the work you did. And, like, uh, I'm glad that you had this learning experience to, like, learn what things work best. And, like, let's, you know, if you want to consult with me next time, like, if you have questions or want to hear my opinion or, like, you know, I'm here as a resource, I feel like is, like, the role they should fill. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. I mean, having skip levels and some sort of access is nice and makes people feel more connected. But if it's for the purpose of coming in, you know, swooping in as the leader on high and criticizing and then taking off, right? Like, you know, there's so much like backstory and context too that a leader wouldn't really get out of that of like, mm -hmm. you have no idea how the team may have collectively come to this conclusion what offline conversations were had anything else and you're just like mm, yeah i just came to check in and i think i think i could do better so uh why don't you go back to the drawing board right like yeah it's yeah, easy instead for me to criticize like, that though but that is 
exactly what I would be tempted to do. Cause like I see anything that's not the way I would have done it. And I'm like, you know, you don't yeah. have to take my advice, but this is how I would have done it just for like, yeah, especially if it saves like, you know, the implementation is like 50 lines of code. And I'm like, here's how you do it in 10. Right. I feel like that's beneficial to everyone, but also sort of, yeah, but it, it then still hinders that person who did that implementation because it's like, yeah, they just feel less than every time because it's like, oh, shit, like I didn't do it 100 yeah. percent the way that like is the best way. So like, yeah, I just get put down all the time. Nobody ever comes up with like a solution that is the top one percent of best solutions like every single time. Right. Like, mm-hmm. you know, your primitive potential- would beg to differ. I don't know. I I mean, I haven't seen his, <laughs> I, yeah, I guess that's not true. I've seen his code on streams, but th- that is to say like, you know, what, what are you arguing against too? Okay. So like, let's think about potential context here of like, are you looking at, I don't know. I mean, are you looking at an Ember application and I don't know, a service for processing metrics through that or you know like what what really are we looking at where you need a hyper performant idealized algorithm every single time is yeah. it you know yeah, i like, think it does depend that's that's a good point of like should if it's very very bad performance wise like i don't know like 15 nested for loops or something like right probably probably bad like but if it's like you know, if it works and there isn't like a performance issue perceptible to the user, then I don't think you should care. And then also like never get involved with like, Oh, you should put a semicolon here or a space here or a like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. Again, if you're doing that, it's just like, yeah. yeah. Subjective opinions. Like what are you in there? You're making your CTO of a multi-billion dollar company or whatever you know like maybe that's not the case here but like you're a cto responsible for the technical success of your organization and do you think those comments are are reinforcing that goal how about that like think about right is is what you're doing directly impacting that in any way or are you just coming into flex and like pump your own ego because that's what it feels like. Yep. So I would say most of the time, no, as a CTO down in the weeds of pull requests and, you know, having subjective commentary about some of those things is probably not beneficial. I can't think of one positive that would go there. Like, Oh, I've come in and taught Robbie something that, he hadn't realized before and now I'm going to expect a 10 X performance out of that interaction. Right. Like, is that an outcome? Is that something like, I mean, I'm, I'm a constant learner and I'm honestly open for discourse around these things. But like, you know, I would wonder if the CTO was looking at my stuff, like, am I that bad or is like, what has brought this on that everyone else in this team has not seen this as a problem and we're moving forward to deliver, you know, and maybe you need to be doing training like from your direct reports down or something then like maybe you need to be talking to your directors or managers and well, I think it all comes down to communication on all levels. Like the, the people that are doing the developing should be opening up open forum. I'm going to implement this thing. Here's how I'm thinking about doing it. Yeah. Anyone have any reservations about that? Then also like maybe those people happen to also be like big time experts in certain technologies. And like, whereas engineering leadership doesn't realize that. And they're like, Oh, I would do it this way. You know, mansplaining to them of like how it goes. And it's like, Oh, well I'm actually an expert in this. And like, yeah, here's the reason why I think it should actually be this way. Yeah. So I think that communication also like, you know, always talking about that. I, I've all, this is somewhat related like to, you know, getting promotions and doing whatever you need to be your own advocate of like, it feels weird to be like, I did this thing and it is cool as shit. And just like post that in a like 
you know, yeah. channel. Cause that's like not what I would normally do. I would just be like building stuff, move on to the next thing. But like, you've got to yeah. be your own advocate and advertise everything you're doing. And like that, that builds the trust too. Cause then if like leadership sees all that, they're like, Oh, he's doing a lot of cool stuff. And like, yeah, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, I, it's kind of a sad reality around like performance and promotions and things like that, that, I don't think is true in many industries and I'm happy to be corrected if there happen to be like, you know, architects or, or doctors or whatever listening to this podcast where like, well, yeah, I mean, I guess like doctors are an interesting different thing too. I mean, you have like peer reviewed publications that people will get involved in and obviously you can get, you know, some kind of advocacy and, and, you know specialized celebrity in those groups with that but like normal path like i don't know yeah it just feels strange that what 10 years ago would have been just like you just sit in the corner and crank out prs and you do it for a little while and show that you're getting better and better at it and you get promoted that's just happens yeah and now it feels the same as like look at me look at me Yeah. It's like, it has nothing to do with output and it's honestly the opposite way. It's like, Mm -hmm. if you do too many commits, we see you're a lone wolf and you're not mentoring the team and pairing with them and getting them to commit. And you're not like delegating and like, well, okay, that might be true. But if I can knock all that shit out, like do 10 developers work in no time and like really crank stuff out. Is it really beneficial for me to spend all of my time teaching them? You know, they would say yes, because like theoretically everyone will level up continuously until we're all at that level. But like, I would say no, if like, if I know how to implement a thing and I can do it in five minutes and it'll take me two hours to pair with you to figure it all out, then what's the point? Let me just implement it real quick. Like if it's a medium sized thing, then it's like, you know, that it's gray area, but yeah, the onus yeah. has shifted there a lot, I think. That's an interesting thing to say. Okay, you say you're a senior on the team and you are asked to level up those around you, help your team improve and get to your level. When it used to kind of be, it definitely used to be the other way around. It was the onus was on you to seek like answers and mentorship and like, kind of get yeah. buy-in for that. Like people yep. could be like, fuck off, go read the, go read the manual. And then you would have to like go and bang your head for a while and come back with better questions, I guess. Right. And then mm-hmm. maybe over time somebody could see like, great, you're putting in some effort. You're trying to get it. Okay. I'll answer your questions. Maybe next time I'll pair with you or I'll show you how to do this thing and where to find these other answers. It's true. I I do see a big shift in that. And for better or worse, like, what is that? Like, it's a transference of onus. And maybe not for the better. Now that I kind of think about it, right? Like, because we've had such an influx in the industry of people, you know, becoming developers and, like, getting into the industry for various reasons and that's okay. You know, you might, maybe you want money or freedom and those kinds of things are appealing. And as long as you're willing to work for it during the time that you're asked, I, you know, you don't have to be in love with your, your life or your job, but you do have to have some proficiency mm-hmm. and the onus is on you to get said proficiency. Is it on someone else to sort of guide you there? And I, I do th- feel like there's a shift that to that. Yeah. And I think you got to want it and go get it. And you can't expect someone to take you along on that ride. But yeah, unfortunately, I think you're right that it's like it's flipped because I'm happy to help as much as you want. But ask me for help. Be like, I'm having problems with these things. Can you yeah. help me with X, Y, Z? Why should I assume you want that? Yeah, I shouldn't just be always like checking in and like, you know, I'm a resource, but like. I'm a as needed resource. I don't need yeah. to be pairing every day or delegating all of my tasks that I know I could do in five minutes. So let me spend an hour writing the ticket up and like planning it all. And like, no, I already know the implementation. I don't need to write it all down. Yeah. 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 It's an interesting thing because like it was very simple and it essentially would be like you have juniors to seniors on your team 
and you know that you're going to expect a higher velocity out of senior people, and you also can expect them to take higher, compl more complex tasks, right? Mm -hmm. And so someone has to show they're taking greater challenges and they have more output in some way. And those metrics are pretty straightforward. So I wonder where that kind of went askew. And then more of the mentorship would always follow people when they really like started to get on the path of leadership. So I was never really responsible for that very much. More like stringently through HR qualifications or whatever until tech lead. Once you became a tech lead, like on a project team or whatever on a team, then it was sort of like, yeah, you're going to help be architectural decisions. You're going to help make sure you unblock the team. Like at that point, you're making sure the every, the individuals are performing like on, on the ground, boots on the ground kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, and I've seen shifts where like tech lead has kind of gone away too in some things, which is strange because that was the clear thing is like you're potentially looking at leadership try before you buy you get to set the direction of your team enjoy yeah yeah it's i do want to wrap up this and get to some whatnot but like yeah. it it does feel like you used to be able to just level yourself up if you wanted to just be an individual contributor you can be a principal engineer and just crank out code and like, yes, of course, you're going to help people. An engineer at any level should be able to help people succeed and be a resource. And, you know, oh, I've solved these problems before. Here's how you might do it, you know, whatever. But like that shouldn't be your job shouldn't be delegating. That's like that's a manager's job. They yeah. delegate the work. Yeah. A engineer yeah. should be doing work. <laughs> like, right. I mean, if you're building a house and you're putting the frame together, you're right. And you have the carpenters there. You're like, well, listen, Chuck, you better make sure Robbie puts in at least 114 nails today. If he doesn't, <laughs> that's not going to look good for you. It doesn't matter if you put 300 nails in. Unless Robbie gets to 114, it's, we're going to have a talk about your performance, which <laughs> yeah. is Robbie's performance. Yeah. Yep, that is how it feels. Yeah. But speaking of how things feel, tell me about Love is Blind. Oh, boy. What can I tell you about Love is Blind? I mean, there's apparently been like a ton of seasons of this. It's a Nick Lachey, Vanessa Lachey, I forget her uh, name before, Men Menudos or whatever. I don't know. She was on some, you know, entertainment show, entertainment news show for forever ago. So it's this like post Jessica Simpson wife. Seem like lovely people. I don't know. Mm. Nick Lachey is from Cincinnati, Ohio, by the way. Fun so track. Love is Blind is different than Married at First Sight. Ye, kind, well, yes, because there's a courting. So, because there's a courting part, so they get put in these pods. So it's like you have the men on one end and the females on another, and then there is these pods, and then they'll just have these different scheduled times where, like, a male and female go in together. Everybody meets everyone, and then you sort of decide who you're interested in, and then you do these dates where you never see each other. There are these pods, and they can hear each other, but that's it. And then okay, they keep so you're coming. interacting directly via voice. You just don't get to see them. Yeah, you don't get to see okay. them. So there's the blind part. And then at you know the end of whatever period, people you've been dating or whatever else, you essentially, I, I guess this is decide, well, I mean, so the men and women, whatever else they're dating. So say you're a guy, you're dating two women. You decide one that you want to break up with, one that you want to move forward. And like, then they do go like down a marriage path, but they don't get married. They still are, they get engaged. So they see each other the first time they can get engaged there. And that's that. And then they, does anyone this, ever like, nope out of that? Like, Ooh, once you they look see different each other, than I thought. <laughs> so no, well, this is funny. So in this recent season, I've heard it in the background tangentially or whatever else. And that's kind of like the thing. Sarah will usually watch it by herself. There's been times where I'm like, well, I'm going to play switch. I'll just be sitting there and it's happening. And then like this one, there was like a particular couple that just kind of like stood out very funny to me. So it was like guy is dating two different women. One has a 10 year old kid and then the other, you know, doesn't or whatever else. And she's like a flight attendant. But like the one is like, I mean, she's like a, 
up there. She's like a nine, whatever. I don't know. I don't want to classify. She's a very attractive lady. Sure. As a kid, kind of throws him off. And then the other one tell like mentions somehow, like people sometimes say, I look like a celebrity. And he's like, well, which one? And she said, I don't know, the one that was in Transformers and Machine Gun Kelly or whatever. He's like, people tell you you look like Megan Fox. <laughs> Let me just tell you, that's not the case with her. She's fine. But, you know, she's misrepresenting a little bit. So then, because he had doubts about the lady with the kid, who is super hot, he kind of goes this other direction. So then when he meets her, he's all like, and he even mentions a couple of times, like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's funny. You told me the Megan Fox thing, huh? Yeah, okay. (laughs) Like, he he was definitely like, and even says it in a little one-off interview thing, like, yeah, she said she looks like Megan Fox, not exactly. Oh, I'm very attracted to her, though, but, like, not exactly. And so you can see <laughs> he has some doubts there. And then later on, I, I guess I'm giving away things. I don't know if you care. but uh, I'm not going to watch it. I mean, later if on. If anyone listening to this wants to, to watch it, no uh, just stop, like, no, stop listening. No doubt. So at some point later on, so they all go, all the couples go and do this, like, five-day honeymoon-like thing. And then they got to go home and live and try to make it work. And at some point... During that, he sees a picture of the girl he turned down, and his you could just see he's like regretting that. And then they like so they did like six episodes, and then they like doing the mid season break. It's super annoying, even on Netflix, which is bullshit. That's yeah, just dragging it out. That is weird. But uh, so there's that interesting drama of like, and yeah, I don't know. They preview some stuff that looks like it is going to get even more interesting. So I think it's kind of hilarious. Yeah, I mean, I think all of these shows are, like, interesting. I don't... I, I think they're all, you know, somewhat trashy, but it's like... They're totally trashy. I've seen, like, one season of, like, 90 Day Fiance or something, and then there's 100 more, and, you know, those happen, and I don't pay attention, but every yeah. once in a while I zone in, and I'm like, okay, well, this this situation is interesting to me. Yeah, and I wonder how much of it is just scripted, too, because it's yeah, like... It's, yeah. It's got to have drama. If it doesn't, it, no one will watch it. We've had like but, uh, 30 years of reality TV now, right? So, and probably more than that, but like but, but it being like a really mainstream genre, right? Since the real world is like, oh yeah, mm. people want this, more of it. I don't know. Yeah. I don't watch it, but I watch everything else. I've mm. been watching all of the Law and Orders that just came back on recently. You and every grandmother. I don't know. Like, hey, listen, we're on, going. what, season 25 of SVU? I'm, I'm watching it till it ends. <laughs> like <laughs> It won't. That's the point. Uh, AI content will be good enough, and they'll just keep it going in perpetuity. Um, <laughs> they name? could. Uh, yeah. What's her name? Like Marissa Hargitay. Marissa Hargitay, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she'll, she'll just get cloned and retire. You know, I'll make this show as long as you want. Just keep backing the like trucks of cash up to my house, and whenever you guys are done, let me know, and I'll retire. <laughs> right, exactly. And then I'm good to go forever. Yeah. So I'm not going to let you get out of this, though. Speaking of the Switch, when are you going to start playing Tears of the Kingdom? <sighs> I've been Man. very into it in another cycle. I just got the Master Sword finally. I've been putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. But then I started to get a few armor sets, and I can kill Gleox, and I did the first battle with Phantom Ganon, and it was like, I mean, I just brute forced my way through, so I was like, nah, I'm all right, I'm doing okay here. And so I kind of started the main quest again. Yeah, I have no idea when I'm going to get to start it, because like, even when I do have some free time, I don't get to play what I want, because it's like, there's this new game out now. I honestly forget even what it's called. Let me see. I got it in a text here. It's called uh, Robbie uh, Does What His Wife Says. Helldivers 2 came out. It was like this big thing on Instagram and stuff too. Like it's apparently popping off. Mm-hmm. But uh, every Switch night now. Or something else? I think it's it's on maybe just PC. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know what it's on. I would be playing it on PC. So I know it's on that. But. Uh, like 
everybody's like, Hey, let's play this. And like every night it's like, you want to play this? And like, it's like 10 PM and you've probably been in bed for like six hours at this point, but do you want to play this? And I'm like, no. So like if I had time to play anything, I'd probably have to play with them and figure that out. And like, See, it's hard Tears to of the have Kingdom free time. is just for you. Yeah, that's true. I, yeah. I heard that you're going to be helping out a, a side hustle that really is going to need the rest of your time. So <laughs> you side main hustle. And, yeah, every time oh, I think I'm going to have some time, it's like yeah. I don't even know where the time goes. People want to like, give I'm you not money. Getting any, huh? People will want to give you money. That's the difference. No, no, I know. But I mean, like, I have... Like, I don't know. I'm like, oh, look, it's like 9 a.m. And then it's like, wait, it's like the end of the day. And it's like, I didn't waste any time. I yeah. worked ish, like, you know, maybe not that hard, <laughs> but like, I wasn't like watching videos or like doing like anything recreational, yet all of my time's still gone. And I'm like, what even happened? Like, yeah, it goes by in a blur. I mean, yeah. especially like podcast days for me. Any other podcast things? Obviously, this morning we were on with Taylor and Guidance Counselor 2.0. I wonder what mm-hmm. the 1.0 was like. I didn't forgot to ask him. Just normal but, Guidance Counselor? Yeah, he's like Tosh.0 kind of thing. Anyway, um, yeah, and then like the day is over. So. Yep. And then you drink some Sinatra. You yep. have a solid three. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, know. I will go put some some frank on the the turntable after this though that's true yeah what's your favorite frank sinatra song i honestly don't really even know i just like it's background jazz like i couldn't tell you what the songs are i like them all i like his voice but i don't summer i'm wind. not like this one is a a banger <laughs> like, go, go look for summer wind when the summer wind comes creeping in probably it sounds better this. than that. i have like yeah it's a good one the Frank's be- like greatest hits or whatever, and it's got yeah, like, it's like used probably to be a two CD set or something. Or something. Oh, yeah. okay. I had this like two CD set for a while. It was like pretty good, and then CDs. Well, this is a thing. on a record, so it, it holds. Oh, even stuff. better, it has that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Summer Wind. That's the one I pick up. Anyway, speaking of summer winds, nothing. Yeah, I mean, speaking of summer winds, we're over time, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. Yeah, if you liked it, uh, tell your friends because yeah, doing definitely don't and, leave us any ratings or reviews because we hate it when you yep. review the podcast. It sucks. Never do that. Yeah, please just listen and lurk and ignore us and don't mm-hmm. press the five stars. Definitely message me on LinkedIn. It's my favorite platform for talking with people, and I take it very seriously. Yeah, you can find me on MySpace. Just forward slash there. emo kid it was robbie core but <laughs> oh gosh probably had a belt buckle with that on it too didn't you? well i didn't have a custom belt buckle but i had a big cadillac belt buckle with like a studded rainbow belt like it was wow it was it was a thing <laughs> was it though it was anyway on that note folks thanks for listening and watching If you liked it, keep it to yourself. Yep. See ya. Boom, 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 boom.